Hello, it's uh, Saturday, April 29th. I am making an astrology video today, and my topic for this video is going to be about moving on and uh, don't look back. One of the, th one of the um, strong aspects right now is Mars and Cancer making a perfect sextile to Uranus and Taurus. Uranus is often a planet that's associated with revolutions and breakthroughs and new developments and Mars is a planet that has to do with cutting, separating, that kind of stuff. However, Mars is in Cancer where it's in its fall, so Mars doesn't really do well in Cancer. Um, it's not really, because Cancer is a sign that's all about emotional attachment, it's all about sentimentality, all this kind of stuff, and um, it's a very sensitive moment we're walking into right now because we've got a lunar eclipse in Scorpio coming up, which is probably going to be a pretty big deal. I, in my impression has been this whole lunation cycle leading up to this is we're probably already feeling the dynamic, right? And um, at the same time, we also have a Mercury retrograde in Taurus, that's, and that's the same sign that Uranus is in. And I think one of the things to keep in mind with Mercury retrograde is that there's nothing wrong with mulling things over. There's nothing wrong with uh, concerning both sides of the uh, the story, and that you don't have to, that we don't have to rush into a decision about things right now. We can kind of slow down and uh, consider our options, basically, right? However, it's one of the things that I've been noticing has well, I've been going through a certain process. Of which, for the most part, I think I'm. Um, it's not really necessary for me to sh share my own inner process on my channel here, but part of that process has been dealing with certain emotional material that's been coming up. And um, one of the things is that my meditation teacher recommended that maybe I could see a therapist because there's, you know, spirituality and meditation is one thing. And therapy is another, and they often kind of work together, um, and they certain, certainly share the common territory. But often there's a kind of a difference where spirituality tends to be about the cessation of desire and attachment, and whereas therapy is often more framed in terms of what is it that you want to do and what's holding you back from doing what you want to do, and so. But the thing is, the two of them kind of go together because, you know, the Buddha talked about walking the middle way, right? Not going to extremes. And to be, there's a, the idea of if you were taking spirituality really serious, there's the story of the Siddhartha, the Buddha, of like being a total ascetic that didn't even eat food, that was basically on the verge of starving and stuff like this, and that he attained enlightenment when a woman walked by and gave him something to eat right? So it's like the, the you're, and the, so it's kind of like this idea of the balance of two things and that with Mercury retrograde, it's important to consider that Mercury is a planet that is kind of like a negotiator, that's kind of like a mediator, um, that when it comes to, for example, the conversation about the underworld, Mercury was one of the few gods that could go and kind of run errands and run messages back and forth across the me the underworld, and, uh, and you know he's a communicator and he doesn't he's seen as not belonging strictly to the the day world or the night world, the yin or the yang, and that's why Mercury is associated with this kind of like being fluid, right? Mercury is fluid. Mercury can go both ways, communicate with both teams. And it's kind of a go-between between these different forces, right? And with Mercury retrograde, um, we've got that kind of quality of that dynamic of negotiating between these different dynamics going on, right? And that we don't have to rush for a, um, uh, a solution that we can kind of take our time because it's going to be a while while Mercury kind of goes back and forth or whatever, right? That being said... I think with Mars, with a sextile to Uranus, you know, at least it's a sextile, so it's not a square, so it's more cooperative anyway. So there's more of an opportunity for a cooperative kind of 
breakthrough, a pro cooperative problem solving, that kind of thing. Um, and, but, um, what am I trying to say here? One of the themes that has been coming up to me anyways, there's a, there's a musician I like, hold on, my dog is scratching at the floor. What is it, June? I guess I might as well say it, is that one of the things that I have been running into anyways is this issue, the fact that I am in my mid-30s, I'm 36, and I had some health issues a couple of years ago and ended up moving back in with my family and I was really sick for a while. And um, one of the things that with Mars and cancer, it, it often gets framed as like cutting the umbilical cord, right? And... That is something, you know, it can be kind of emotionally triggering for me because I, there may be sort of like shame, feelings of insecurity, feelings of not being good enough, feelings of being inferior or weak and dependent because I'm living with my family and I'm not like an independent man, basically, right? And, you know, in four years, I'm going to be four years old. And I don't want to be a 40 year old who's, you know, feels like a teenager living with his mom, basically, right? But I think one of the things that I've been learning is this idea of um, that, you know, when we're talking about moving on, if you, do, you know, I'm thinking, I did a first session with a, this therapist. And after this first session, I was kind of thinking, well, you know, how much therapy do I really need to do if like, because the whole thing is like, what, what does moving on mean anyways, right? And like, they say, you know, what do you want, right? What do you want for yourself, right? And I was kind of exploring, because it's like, I was kind of exploring this and I kind of had some realizations, which what, and some of those realizations were when I consider moving on, a lot of what comes up for me is actually images and memories from my past that represented what moving on looked like when I was at that stage of my life, right? There were certain times, like, there was when I, the time that I moved on when I decided to leave living at my parents' house for the first time and got an apartment in Vancouver and got a job in Vancouver. There was the time I decided to move on by, um, leaving Vancouver and going to Australia for a whole year, right? Um, and there's a and the stuff that I did when at that age when, and uh, the kind of lifestyle I led and that I had some, you know, I had some stuff. There's this old stuff there about like that being judged as being kind of like reckless because I was, you know, I did stuff that people thought was kind of crazy, like, you know, in Australia, they had this sort of, a lot of people in Australia are scared of hitchhiking because they had these serial killers and stuff like that and that would kill, hit, like, <laughs> seriously, yeah, people, I would pick it, pick, I was hitchhiking, people would be like, you're fucking crazy, man, don't you know there's serial killers that kill hitchhikers? But it was like, I was in this position where there was nobody there to control me to tell me not to go hitchhiking, <laughs> so I could just, I could take that risk, right? I could take that risk myself and deal with the consequences. And, you know, I didn't get killed by hitchhike, by serial killers. Um, and then, you know, back in those days, I was experimenting with drug use and that, you know, maybe I didn't appreciate the risks. And, you know, the thing, the whole thing is eventually when I got back from Australia, I ended up having a psychosis and that probably wouldn't have been so bad if it wasn't for all my drug use and all my psychosis. And I think one of the things that I've been kind of working out is that, you know, it could be, I have to say, I'm my chart is mostly Scorpio and Sagittarius. It could be something about my Sagittarius stellium that I have a natural inclination to being maybe a bit of a risk taker or a gambler or. So, but the thing is, I honestly don't like gambling, and I honestly, I don't, I honestly don't feel that adventurous a lot of the time. I mean, it's kind of this thing where I was, I, I mentioned in one of my videos that I watched The Wizard of Oz, and it was like the way the lion in The Wizard of Oz thinks he needs to ha he he doesn't have courage or whatever and that he's scared of little things that he shouldn't be scared of 
but that cur real courage isn't doesn't mean that you're not scared of that you don't consider the dangers or things that d things don't you're just completely blind and you do dumb shit res le le recklessly like real courage is understanding the risks understanding the danger and having the responsibility to take that upon yourself to deal with it courageously it doesn't mean that you're not you're completely unsensitive to any fear or danger it's like real courage is facing the fear and going ahead with it anyways right and one of the things I mentioned in my last video, something about Gabor Mate, that one of the, one of the things that I was kind of curious about with Gabor Mate is that he kind of talks about like this thing that young people do where young people have these self-destructive patterns where maybe they do too many drugs or they, they get into stuff like skateboarding and they hurt themselves or something. And there's this kind of like self-destructive impulse, right? And, um, you know, when I was a little kid, I thought skateboarding looked kind of cool, but I quickly just kind of realized that it's not really for me. I was never really drawn. I was not so much, so much of a, an adrenaline junkie or that there's something that was seemed normal for teenage boys to do all this really risky, dangerous stuff. And I really, when, I, when, when the time that skateboarding got really popular, I just kind of realized it wasn't for me. And, you know, if, other, if my friends wanted to go breaking their legs on skateboards, I'll, you know, they can do that as much as they want. I, did, I didn't really, didn't really feel like it, right? Um, and so the, the thing is like, I have, there's one of these things where if you, if you're, I kind of have this thing, if, if you have a parental figure that is trying to prevent you from taking risks or doing dangerous things, then you might take it out on the parental figure that they're trying to control you or something like that. That could be, you know, that could be parental figure. It could also be like, you could talk about the nanny state or, you know, look at it at different levels or something, right? But then there's a, what I kind of realized is that it could just be projection that, you know, I am, I have to admit that I am maybe, my idea of me being like a really like courageous, adventurous person has always been, I've always not, you know, I have my own limits, my own fears, my own insecurities. And whenever I did, I've ever done anything adventurous, it's been me trying to face and overcome my own fear and insecurity and just seeing like how far I could go with it and where I felt comfortable with it. It wasn't that though, I didn't have any fear or insecurity. It wasn't that I was trying to live completely dangerously. It was just trying me trying to do whatever I could not to live a life that is completely trapped by fear or so, you know what I mean? And, um, so when it, this whole issue about like moving on and stuff like that, I think there's certain things about like, what I kind of realized was that I have these images or memories of what I was like at these different stages of time when I was doing things that I defined as moving on on, and that those things may be defined as being somewhat maybe reckless or somewhat dangerous. Um, but um, one of the things that I realize is that when this process of healing, right, is that you may have um, these different egos, these different identities from past patterns of behavior in your past that you, that you identify with and that when you're healing, you kind of realize, like, I'm just thinking there's there's this video from Sophie Strand. If I can, if I find it again, maybe I'll link it in the comments. But she was she did this kind of poem about how there was this she had this old personality that had all these kind of toxic behaviors, and that sometimes this personality would come back and kind of like take over her life, and you know engage in all these kind of behavioral patterns that aren't good for her, and she that he, it takes a lot of work not to identify with these kind of things sometimes, right? And that when there, there might be different ways of interpreting what it means to move on from things, right? That we may say moving to move on, you know, I'll maybe moving on is just to go, go hitchhiking around and partying and doing drugs rather than being trapped in whatever circumstance you're in. But then maybe moving on is also moving on from that old ego that identifies as somebody who does all this reckless, dangerous stuff, right? Um, and the whole thing too is that there's certain things that like even, you know, there, I, I've also been, by reading Gabber Monty, I kind of realized that there were, I have a certain emotional attachment, right? Or I need this desire for friends, this desire for a peer group and all this kind of stuff. 
And then by reading that Gabor Mate Myth of Normal book, one of the some of the stuff that I realized was that, um, you know, this, these they're, they're these old identifications, like the the idea that I want friends to hang out and have good times with, and then like what the actual friends to hang out with good. There are a lot of friends that were engaging in really kind of self-destructive behaviors, and that you know that maybe what maybe it's not maybe moving on isn't like maybe moving on is for once and for all moving on from those identifications and not seeing myself in that light and not seeing the kind of friendships that I would have as being those kinds of friendships, right? But it's not black and white. It doesn't mean that that's all of what people are is just a certain pattern of behavior that, you know, you've got more to your life than, you know, those kinds of things going on, right? Um... The other thing I was thinking is that with the Scorpio clips coming up and everything, the conversation about moving on brings to mind this stuff about the myth of Orpheus. And I'm not going to go into the whole story right now, but the most important part is that there's this whole dynamic where Orpheus is trying to save his way from the underworld, and they say, you can save your way from the underworld just you she'll be following behind you and don't look back to make sure she's there just keep going straight forward and then even the thing is there they he, for some reason even though Orpheus was given this direction he couldn't help himself from looking back and then at, well, after Orpheus looks back to his wife his wife gets pulled back to the underworld and then Orpheus is so come overcome with grief by this if I, I, again, I might be fuzzy on the story, but what I remember is that there's this thing where Orpheus is like a lute player, he's a musician, and this is, these are the Eleusinian mysteries, right? The, uh, that there's this thing about Orpheus getting torn apart, right? Um, and I, in my last video about dissolve and coagulate, I was reading from this Thomas Merton, not Thomas Merton, Thomas Moore book, where he was talking about the Dionysian thing of wine or being torn apart, right? And, you know, in, I was thinking in meditation, they talk, they, in meditation, they often talk about centering and being centered and then looking at what it is that's pulling you out, right? Pulling you out from the center, pulling you out from that clear space. And often what I'm seeing is that there are, the whole moving on is that there's these things in my past, these memories, these, whatever you want to say, wounds or old behavioral patterns that you get pulled in, pulled out of the space into the past and that the myth of Orpheus, you know, this might see, sound a little bit gnarly, but I was putting it, I was thinking about this, is that, you know, that there's being centered, there's being pulled out, there's being dragged, there's being torn to pieces, and then there's being ripped to shreds, right? <laughs> Which can sound pretty gnarly, right? But the thing is, is that, you know, I was also started reading this book, the Hesiod, Hesiod's Theogony, and there's something, I don't know if I want to go too far into this, but there's a kind of a paradox there, where, where Hesiod says that there's the, the, the force of memory that pulls you into the past, but if you, if you, if that is really happening and you go with it, then that becomes, that, that memory or nostalgia into the past becomes like an amnesia right? And that there's this thing that the journey to the underworld is like our memory of the past. If we're so pulled out by these memories of the past, by these behaviors of the past, by these patterns of the past, if we really get pulled out by them, there's, it's, there's a dangerous thing because you know, it, but, it, but it depends on what level it happens. You know, so you can watch some people have their lives completely torn apart by these old patterns, by these old traumas, by all this kind of stuff, right? And you could see, you could watch that happen to people and say, this is a really destructive thing and you gotta prevent yourself from getting torn apart like this, right? But at the same time, it, there's a way that if you, if you know, if you be able to refine your way of working with things, it could be a healing process 
Because even if, if you don't, don't let your actual self get torn apart. Don't let your life get torn apart. But let these patterns that are holding you hostage get dissolved. And then once they're dissolved, they're not going to hold you back. They're not going to be there to, to pull you back to the underworld anymore. Because they've... It's, the thing is, it's not you that's going to be destroyed. It's not you that's going to... Well, it's kind of funny. It could be the identification, right? But you got to do it in such a way that you're not destroying your own life. You know what I'm saying? You don't want to make get into fights with your family. You don't want to alienate everybody. You don't want to do act out self-destructive behaviors, right? Um, but... And the thing about it is, is that... Oh, my dog's scratching again. My dog is a little barometer, right? I've decided that when my dog's scratching, it's sort of like a sign that I should probably chill out a little bit. Like, I can kind of watch my dog. She either acts very uh, calm and serene and, and lays on the floor, or else she is nervous and she's scratching. And I realize that she's a good little helper because it lets me kind of see where I'm going with this. And... Um, There's one, I had some idea of some things I could read, and I thought I would read this. I'm reading Faust for the first time. And um, there's something that I hit this part in Faust that just really went with this dynamic, right? Where's the... Like for for this for this dynamic of Mars and Cancer sextile to Uranus and Taurus and all the stuff I've been talking about. No, just keep in mind that. Well, yeah, it's like you can interpret this multiple ways, right? And that it's all it's like how, how what this means for your own life and it and but I just thought this was a great one for the kind of energy at play. Anyways, I'll just read a bit of this. Oh, gentle moonlight, how I wish that you could see the end of all my misery. How often at this desk I sat into the depths of the night and looked for you, until over these books and papers you appeared to me my melancholy friend. If I could roam on mountain heights in your dear light, drift with hovering spirits over caverns, weave over meadows in your twilight glow, I would expel the smoke of learning and be drenched to wholeness in your dew. Alas, am I still wedged within this prison cell? You cursed dank hole in the wall, where even the sweet light of heaven breaks wanly on the painted glass. I'm cooped in heaps of worm-eaten books, thickly laden with dust, with sooty papers fastened all around, extending to the vaulted arches. Retorts and boxes strewn about with pyramids of instruments, the stuffing of ancestral rubbish. This is my world, I must call it a world. And you, and still you wander, still you wonder, sorry, and still you wonder why your heart claws anxiously at your breast, and why a misery yet unexplored stands in the way of stirring life. Instead of pulsing nature where God had once placed man, you're thrust into this soot and mold and ringed by sundry bones and parched cadavers. Away, escape, go out into the open fields. And this volume of mysterious lore in Nostradamus' hand and pen, is it not sufficient company? Once you know the star's procession and nature is your guide and master, when spirit break, speaks to spirit, your soul will then unfold its strength. My barren thoughts are wasted within the sight of sacred science. Spirits, now you hover close to me. If you hear me, answer me. Okay. Because <laughs> oh, that's one of the things that I, I've been feeling, that claw at the breast. And that this sort of, th this, this energy that says to go out to the open field. But the thing, what I'm realizing is that if I take this too literally as an, you know, there's, there's a lot to appreciate where I am with my family 
And that, that maybe what is really, what I have to move on from is my own resentment, my own patterns, my own idea of what moving on is supposed to mean, my own memories of, or my own stories that I have, right? And there's one thing to read. I also have to say that Faust is a historical thing. It, it it's, belongs to a certain period of time. And um, that sometimes it can help to be, to, to look at media and movies and stuff like that that are more recent, right? There, one of the ones I recommend is there's a movie I watched that has uh, Idris Elba in it playing a genie. It's called 3,000 Years of Longing. And I think for me, there's something about the idea of being having you these wishes these desires and having these desires really pull you out to really drag you versus the desire to just stay here the desire to just be here not to go anywhere this desire to like there's a, there's a, I have a hafiz I'm not gonna look for it now there's a great hafiz poem where it's like you know Lord you know let me stay don't take me out of this this dank alleyway you know let me remain here even in this 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 situation and let me be here with as much love as possible and not don't you know I'm not to desire anything and all these things that I've had in the past that are these images of things that I would desire you know I've had enough of that you know I've and, and maybe you guys haven't had enough but I've had enough right <laughs> so it's like there's this kind of and I that I found that that spirit is really there in this movie 3000 years of longing and that, but the thing is, your heart's, the true heart's desire, if it, sometimes there's certain things that you can't, if you, you, you can't deny the desire of the heart, you know, and what the, the, what your heart tells you you must do, and you have to kind of mediate with that, or whatever, but was, so, um, but, you know, it's, um, I don't know, is that enough? I've got, I, <laughs> Okay, well, I think that's probably good enough for now. Anyways, thanks and thanks for watching. Pre please hit the like button and um, subscribe and help my channel grow. I'm, um, you know, I'm I'm sticking with this astrology stuff. This is one thing I like to do. I'm I'm gonna try to just keep going and keep developing it. Um, and uh, I wish all of you luck out there on your own personal whatever personal breakthroughs and personal journeys and and all this kind of stuff and i also want to say that you know sometimes the open field can be right here you know sometimes sometimes what you need is the open field inside your heart you now not to go rushing off <laughs> in the great yonder chasing some sort of desire or fantasy that you can stay here in the heart and have an open space there right okay thank you very much <laughs>